Yes, 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 yes. Awesome. Uh, I might not be able to talk before we're done here. Should have planned those songs a little better. <laughs> Man, I'm excited to be here this morning. And you know, I, I, we, don't have, we didn't have Saturday night this week, so I have a lot of pent-up energy, so just bear with me. I usually blow half of it out before I see you all on Sunday morning, but uh, we didn't do Saturday night. But just want to welcome you here again. Want to welcome those who are watching on Facebook Live with us now and whoever will watch in the future. And uh, let, me just, let me just start by, by asking you this, kind of a, a, an awkward question, but how many people in here just believe in God? Raise your hand. You believe in God, right? Right? And listen, and I, I'm, I'm not talking about like anything in particular, nothing specific, not, not, not like who he is or what he is or what his name is, nothing, no like the, the, uh, you know, theology undergirding that, just like a belief that there's a... There's something up there that kind of rules, you know, uh, the top dog, the big man on campus, the head honcho, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so we have different opinion of what that God would be, but uh, maybe you're just not sure, you know, this is Easter, a lot of people go to church on Easter and it's the only time that they'll go to church all year. Maybe it's the first time you've ever been to church, I'm not quite sure, and so maybe you don't really have an idea about God yet. Yeah, maybe you're kind of curious. Maybe you're wondering. Maybe you're doubting. I'm not quite sure where you are. Uh, maybe you're just not totally into this whole God thing, but someone dragged you here. And to the person who dragged you here, I say, good job. Good job. Good job, soldier. Well, that might be you today. Maybe you're that person who's just not quite sure if there is a God, who he is, who, who he or she or it or whatever is, and maybe you're just kind of wondering. Everybody has an opinion about God, though, right? Uh, some people think he's the transcendent, sovereign king of the universe over everything, but you might think that God is good. You might think that God is bad. You might think that God is kind. You might think that God is mad. Uh, we all have an opinion about who he or she or it is. We're somewhere along that scale. I've got my opinion, and you've got yours. And I'm not here this morning to tell you what your opinion should be. But I will say this with complete confidence, that my opinion and your opinion about who God is does not determine who God is. He is God. And there's nothing that you or I, if we took all of our opinions and we added them up and put it into a bag, it would be a garbage bag compared to who he is. Okay? He decides who he is. And so, no, but here, here's the thing. Normally, you go to church, whether it be here or somewhere else, and you hear some dude like me get up, and, and, he, and he yells at you for an hour, and he tells you what's wrong with your life, and then he tries to tell you, you know, like, what, how you can fix it. And, and here's the good thing about a train wreck like me. See, just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you got it all together. And you, if y'all come here, you know that, right? <coughs> you weren't supposed to say amen. <laughs> supposed to let all these new people know that I have it all together, dude. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the nice thing about being a pastor, right? You don't have to have it all together. That's all you have to do is tell people about the one who has it all together. And then you're kind of off the hook, right? So it's kind of cool. So, so, so not everybody has it all together. Not at all. Not everybody knows what's going on. Not, not everybody knows uh, what to do. And I'm not the guy who's going to get up here today and tell you what you should do. Who, who likes being told what to do anyway? Show, show me your hands. Yeah, I kind of figured that, right? We're Americans. No one's going to tell us what to do. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell you what to do. So why don't we all practice this together? Let's just practice. Let's inhale. Let's exhale. That pressure's off. No one's going to tell you what you should think, what you should do. I will say this, though, that God, whoever he or she or it is, does have a certain level of influence and impact upon you. Even as a passive recipient, even if you're not like sure about who God is, or you're not like totally into the whole God thing, you definitely are impacted by this God, whether you're into him or you're just a passive recipient, you know? Uh, your heart's beating, the sun goes up and down, the waves crash, babies are born, you had nothing to do with it, right? 
Everybody, no matter what your opinion is about him or it, is impacted by him or it in some way or another. Can we all agree to that? We can. And this type of interaction, this type of influence, this type of impact upon you, it transcends our individual religious or faith beliefs or perspectives or lack thereof. It just is. You had nothing to do with the sun coming up this morning. You, even though you think that the sun might rise and fall on you, uh, newsflash, it doesn't. Okay? And so we're all recipients of his power in some way, whether we're passive or actively getting after it. Well, let me ask you this. This is just a what if. What if being a passive recipient of what God does and who he or she or it is, just what if? What if it meant you were just kind of shortchanging yourself? Just a thought. What, what if there was more? You know, people tend to, like, find God in the most chaotic seasons of their life. It's common, right? You just, everything's, you're going along in life, everything seems to be going good, and then there's like this big problem, and, and you find yourself, you know, in jail. And we, find our, we find God in our foxhole at war. We find God in divorce and sickness and death and bankruptcy and all these different things where we kind of find God, you know? But what if that's not you? What if you stumbled into this joint here this morning, but you're not in some chaotic season of your life? Actually, you could look at your life and just go, you know what? I mean, it's maybe not all it's cracked up to be. Maybe it's not all I thought it could be. But, you know, if I look at my life, it's actually not that bad, right? Maybe it's not that bad. Maybe it's pretty good. But what if, and again, just a maybe, what if, even though your life was good, what if on the table there was an offer of a life that's totally unique to you? It's, it's not the same as even the person that you're sitting next to, not, not, not to the same as the person you're married to, but just a life that was totally unique to you, that in some crazy way, I know that people think Christians are crazy, but in some crazy way, it far surpassed the life that you have right now. But in ways that you never experienced before. And see, that's kind of a tough sell. That what if is a tough sell. Because with that what if, there's no details promised with it. Like there's some details like, okay, if you have the right thing with God, you get to go to heaven. Like I get all that. But like, there's no list anywhere in this book that says, this is the exact circumstances of your life. This is exactly how it's going to play out day to day in your relationships, in your career, in your finances. All, like, there's nothing in the book that says, this is exactly how it's going to go if you... That's why it's a what if. I don't know about you, but I've been told dozens and dozens and dozens of times in my life, and I've told other people this. Don't what if yourself to death. Ever hear that? You know, look on the horizon. What if this happens? What if that happens? And we what if, what if, what if, what if? What if I lose my job? What if my car breaks down? What if my spouse leaves? What if my kids get sick? What if this, what if I'm going on a cruise. What if the ship goes down? What if, what if, what if? Well, today I just want to maybe offer you something different. Maybe we should just like, instead of what ifing ourselves to death, let's what if ourselves to life. That's what I'd like to do today with you. I want to read a, a short section of the Bible, and here at our church, uh, we're a Bible church, and so every single week you're going to hear either myself or whoever is at this pulpit, they're going to say these words, open your Bible to. Uh, the reason why we say that is because... Um, I'm a flawed man. Pastor Jay's a flawed man. I mean, who knows who's going to be up here? And listen, I'm telling you right now, I used to sell cars for a living. So open your Bible to Matthew. I want you to see what God says about himself, not about what I think. Because let me tell you about what I think. It doesn't matter. What I think means nothing. What God says is everything. If we're going to formulate some ideas and, and beliefs 
about God. It should be about it should be based on what God says, right? Not what some man says. So I want to read this, just this short section in, in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. It's this, this little event called the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? The resurrection. It's it, listen, it's historic. It's not disputed. Like nobody says it didn't happen. No one's saying it. They might not make a big deal of it. But no one's saying it didn't happen, right? No one. And so I want to read this section with you. And then I want to what if this thing to life. So Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 1. You there? Anyone need another minute? Don't want to leave. Everyone should have their eyes on God's word. That's why you're here. You didn't come here to be entertained. You came here to read God's word, right? Okay, so put your eyes on God's word. Matthew 28. Oh, I've read that before. Read it again. (coughs) Early on Sunday morning, sounds like now, right? As the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. So Jesus had, had died on the cross, and he was buried, and they went out to visit the tomb. And so in another gospel, it tells us why. They had some spices and all, and they were going to kind of use it to kind of embalm his body, you know just to honor him and all. So they went out to the tomb. It says, Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. This is going to be a great place for an amen. You ready? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You see him there. You'll see him there. Remember what I've told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went... Jesus met them and greeted them. And it's kind of cool that when you're on, your, on the road to your final destination, which I hope is glory with Him, that if we're obedient to go pursue that final destination, sometimes along the way there's blessing, right? And Jesus just, just comes and, and blesses you in some way just to say, hey kid, you're doing it the right way. Keep going. And this is what happens here. They're on the road to the final destination there, but along the way, as they went. I mean, there's some blessing in there. Just think about that. As they went. I mean, that's a sermon right there. As they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Amen. Amen. So, so this little story, right, just this one, it's not little in its magnitude, but it's kind of short. But this little story is part of this meta-narrative of Scripture, this whole book, the history of God and people. And so it kind of goes like this. There's this, these two people, Adam and Eve, maybe you've heard of them. They were the first people, and they were told by God, you can do all this stuff, but don't do this. And of course, what do they do just like us? They did this. And so they sinned, and because there's sin in the world, like there's disease and storms, all this bad stuff happens, there's sin. Now listen, you, you can't fix that problem. Like, I was thinking about this today. If you have a perfectly operating vehicle, if you buy a car from the dealership, brand new, and it's beautiful, and it's got computers and all this stuff, and navigation, it'll get you to your final destination in style. But the one thing it can't do It's not smart enough or able to fix itself. If it's broke, it doesn't matter if it's a smart car or not. It needs a mechanic. And we do too. We're broken. And because we're broken, we can't fix ourselves. And so there's this great need for for a mechanic. We need a mechanic. We need a Messiah, right? And so there's this Messiah that's promised like years and years before Jesus ever shows up. And he's going to be born to a certain person certain type of person, certain city, and all of a sudden, Jesus Christ is born to a virgin. You know what her name was? Mary, Mary. yeah, exactly. And he lives a sinless, perfect life. 
But even though he lives a sinless, perfect life, he dies on a cross to pay for sin. But it's not his sin because he never did. And then he was buried and then he rises from death to forever show death and hell that he rules even over them. And then he ascends to heaven. He takes his throne. He prepares a place for all that are his. And this is going to be another place for an amen. And then one day he's coming back to gather both all of his that are living and dead to be with him forever in heaven. That's, that's some story, ain't it? That's, that's an epic story. That's an incredible story. It kind of makes my nine to five feel weak. You? But here's the cool thing, though. Yeah, your 9 to 5 is kind of weak. My 9 to 5 can be weak. But that epic story that, he's, that, he, that is Jesus, he calls you into it. You get to be part of that if you choose to be. You can be a passive recipient, hopefully just like Pete Rose into, into a home plate in heaven someday. Or you could choose. Say, I can choose. I can choose. Say it like you mean it. I could choose something different. I could choose to be part of that, that epic story. Uh, listen, epic story of fighting light against darkness for the souls of all mankind. That's what you could be a part of if you choose to be. It's an amazing reality. But just here in this portion of this meta-narrative that we read today, we see that the lady disciples visit the tomb. The Roman guards are guarding the tomb. And an angel of the Lord shows up at the tomb. And when he shows up at the tomb, there's a, I was going to, I was going to do like a big massive earthquake and scare everyone like crazy this morning. Like have it come through the sub and just blow your brains out. Boom, right? Where's your brother? Where's your brother? Yeah, where's your brother? Man, he would do an earthquake perfect, wouldn't he? And we'd have the run. But listen, we could pull off the earthquake sound but how do you pull off a face like lightning? I don't know how to pull that one off, so I just held back. But like, here's the deal. That's crazy, right? They're sitting there, and all of a sudden there's an earthquake, and this dude shows up, and his face is lightning all over it. It's crazy. And, and, and so, listen, angel, the angel of the Lord, they're, they're, just, they're messengers from God, right? And, and sometimes in the Bible, they're kind of, they look like men, and sometimes they're like, Scary, right? I don't even know what they're big and scary. Why does he, if it just looks like a man, why is he saying, don't be afraid? It's kind of, it's going to have to be scary, right? It's going to be scary. So the angel of the Lord is the messenger of God. But sometimes, like in Genesis 22, the angel of the Lord is actually God himself showing up. That's big and that's scary, right? It's super, super big. Either way, whether it's God himself or his messenger with lightning all over his face, either way, it's scary. It's big when God shows up in your life. And, and I'm, I'm not talking about just like hearing a story at all. I'm talking about when he shows up in your grill, in your face, knocking on your door, calling you to something, trying to get your attention. And maybe he's doing that this morning. Maybe he hasn't started, but maybe he's going to any minute now. I don't know what's going to happen. That's up to him. So, but we see here in the stories, we see two responses to this. God shows up. Boom! Big deal, right? We see two responses. The first one's the Roman soldiers. They fall into a dead faint. You know what they did? Nothing. They did nothing. They didn't say, well, it didn't happen. They didn't say it's not a big deal. They just did nothing. They never said it was nothing big. No, they acknowledge, obviously, that God is real. They fell into a dead faint. They realize that God is real, that he's impressive, but they do nothing in response. And why? Maybe you see yourself in that, too. Maybe God is a big deal. You acknowledge by raising your hand that there's a God, and he's big but you don't get him. But maybe you're like the Roman soldiers. He shows up in your life and you just do nothing. And why is it the day and you do nothing? It says right there in the text, I'm not brilliant. They were scared. They were scared. They were scared. And isn't it like us? Maybe we choose to do nothing with God because we're scared of the unknown. We don't know what it's going to be like to follow him. And so we're just willing to settle for what we already have. And that's it. 
Maybe we're not willing to give up control of our life because, you know, in our arrogance, you know, i got to know some stuff about this dude before I let him tell me what to do. That, that's called no faith. I'm not going to make fun of you. I don't think it's funny actually at all. I think it's sad. But it's no faith. And I can't give you faith. It's something God has to do with you. But that's just a show of no faith. But there's a second group of people there in this text. The Roman soldiers did nothing. They just plopped down on the ground and acknowledged that he's there and that it's a big deal, but chose to do nothing with it. But then there's the ladies. They were there. The earth shook the same for them. The angel's face lit up just the same for them. And it says that they were frightened. They didn't know what it was like to go follow Jesus. Jesus had gone ahead of them, it said, to Galilee, and now they... With all this persecution, Jesus had just been killed right in front of them. Now I have to follow him. The authorities are out. They're looking for Christians. And now you want me to go follow him. So they were frightened, not only about what happened, but what could be. They didn't know what was coming on the horizon for them. They didn't know what to expect. But they chose, that's a strong word. They chose to follow and obey him. That's faith. They didn't know what to expect but they did it anyway. And all of us pretty much fall into one of these two categories or somewhere in between. Both people, both parties, every person in this room, you raise your hand, you acknowledge that there's a God, but you choose to do nothing with Him or you can choose to obey and to follow Him. That's your choice. And I would doubt, I would doubt highly that there was anyone in this room that when I shared that story of Jesus a minute ago from Adam and Eve all the way to Jesus coming and going to the cross and all that, like you weren't going, really, that happened? Like no one, right? We're in America. Like everyone's kind of heard of that. We know you weren't like surprised. <laughs> Most Americans know about Jesus. They would even acknowledge his historical reality. But an honest assessment of your life would absolutely indicate that you've chosen to do nothing about that reality. I'm not talking about changing your schedule around your favorite television show. I'm not talking about finding a career that pleases you. I'm talking about Jesus Christ comes from heaven down here, lives a perfect life, goes to the cross, is buried, and resurrects. And you've done virtually nothing with that. And I would just ask you this. What if there's more? What if there's more? Maybe you're leaving something on the table that would be an awesome thing for you. I can't tell you what you're missing. Because, let's just, let's just like, brass tacks. I, I've been following the Lord now for, what, 15 years? And I don't follow him really, really well. I do, I do all right at best. I'm going to give myself a C. But my life with him and the things that he's done in and through my life are totally different than Jay's. He's been following the Lord for 35, 45, 50 years, whatever, a long time. And he's, give yourself a C? Plus. C plus? <laughs> I'm going to start teaching a class on arrogance. And, and I'm just kidding. I, I love you. But, I mean, his thing with Jesus is just different than mine. You know what I mean? Like, I, it's different. So I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen if you choose to follow and obey him. I, I don't know. And the, this is... I, it's different in this world. The world is different because like you go on TV and what they'll do is they'll say, okay, if you buy this product, this is what happens, right? If you go to school at this college, this degree is what you get, unless you're Kyle and it's nine years later. Get it? <laughs> so, so that's not the way Jesus is. Jesus is, is, is follow and obey and we'll see what happens. And that's just the best sale I can give you, but it's a real one. It's a real one. And so there's this guy, his name is Paul, 
and, and he wrote much of the New Testament. And, and, he, and he was, listen, he was a, a Christian killer. He, he was a dude that was going around when the church first started, when people first started to gather like we're doing here, and he actually would go around and bust through that door and like arrest us and drag us to the authorities so we could be imprisoned and whipped and beaten and, and maybe even killed. That, that's who Paul is, right? He's a rotten guy. But, but he understood that there was more to, to, to this Jesus than just acknowledging that he exists. That there was more to this resurrection that you guys... Like, there's more people here this morning than normal. Now, I wish it wasn't the case, but there's more people here this morning than normal. And the reason why is because it's Easter. It's because of that. And, and, and so we acknowledge that there's a big deal about Easter, but we don't really, it doesn't really sink in more than it's just an event to commemorate something. And, and so Paul says, uh, do me a favor, turn to Philippians chapter 3. He says that there's more to it than that. Okay? More to it than that. Philippians chapter 3. This is, I just want to read, you to read you what he says here. Chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. He, he just says simply this. I want to know Christ. That's good, right? I want to know Christ. I want to get to know him. This is kind of cool because here's a guy who's the great apostle Paul. Right, the church leader, and he's saying, I want to get to know him. So what does that say, tell you? He's never even got there, right? He's trying. He's giving himself a C. The apostle Paul's giving himself a C, right? And so he says, I, I, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. See, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Right? Here's the thing. Churches... And heaven forbid I ever am this guy. They'll gather you in a place and will say, listen, if you give your life to Jesus, things are going to get better for you, man. L listen to what Paul's saying here. I want to know Christ and I want to suffer with him. Like, I want to, now, listen, for those of us who have bent the knee to Jesus, have, has, has he blessed you in some ways? Right? Has there been some mountaintop experiences? Yeah. Mystery checks in the mail? Yeah. Re re relationships restored that you thought never would? Yeah. Prodigal kids that come home? Addictions broke? Marriages restored? All that stuff. Like, that's awesome, right? Yeah. So good things can come, but that's not all of it. Paul says, I want to suffer with him. I want to suffer with him. Sharing in his death. Let's put a clipboard up here as a sign-up sheet to see how many people want to sign up for that class. Now, probably not going to be many. Why does he want to do this? I want to, know, I want to suffer with him. I want to share in his death so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. See, he, he, he says, listen, he says, it's, it's not just this resurrection thing. It's not just to know about Christ and his resurrection. I mean, that's like practically everybody. Everybody knows all about it. Like I read the story a little bit ago, I told you, and no one's going, oh, I didn't know that he rose from the dead. Like everybody knows. So it's not about just knowing about Christ and his resurrection. Everyone knows that. It's not merely acknowledging that it happened. Most people would acknowledge that it happened. Some people have, just have no clue. And it's not even being in awe of it happening. And, and, and some people are in awe of that. Some people don't give a rip. But it's not about just knowing about the resurrection. Not about acknowledging that it happened. Not about being in awe of it. That's all part of it. But Paul says that the resurrection is something to experience. We're not here to just acknowledge that Christ rose from the dead and say, Wow, that's awesome! That's great. But Paul says that there's more to it than that. It's not just what Jesus did. Now he wants, this Jesus wants you to experience the power in this lifetime. See, he says it twice. The, the, don't blow by it. Look what he says. He says, I want, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. That's now. I want to experience it now. I want to get this thing now. I want to feel his power. I want to, feel, I want to sense his presence. And I want to receive his provision now. 
because he's not dead. He's alive and he's there for me. I want that now. But he also says in the life to come, because he goes on, I want to experience the resurrection from the dead. Someday, Jesus Christ is going to rip open the clouds and he's going to come down and those who have fallen asleep in Christ will rise from the grave and they'll join him in the air and be with him forever. That's the resurrection of the dead. So he wants, listen, the, the resurrection is something for you to experience in this life right now. So what if there's something so amazing to be experienced by obeying Jesus and following Jesus, but you're like the Roman guards? You're afraid to do anything because you have no idea what that would look like to follow him. You've been told You've been prayed for, and you know, and you still dig your heels in, and I will not do that. That's us. And so maybe because of that fear, you've done absolutely nothing with God past believing that he is. Maybe that's all you've done with him is, no offense, but come to church on Christmas and maybe Easter and the occasional grace before a meal. And I just wonder, just being honest with you, if God is all he is, is that a sufficient response? Is that all you got? So I want you to think about a couple of things. I want you to what if. I want you to think about all these things I'm going to share with you when you're considering experiencing something more. Okay, so consider this. Uh, back in the book of Matthew, chapter 17, there's this awesome story. This is an amazing story, and, and what's happening here is, is Jesus and his followers, his disciples, he's just got a handful of dudes, and, and they, they go up on this mountain, and they're hanging out with him, and he's doing his Jesus thing, right? And they're sitting there listening to him, and all of a sudden, Elijah, one of the great prophets of the Jewish faith that was alive like a thousand years before, like he shows up on the mountain with them. That's freaky, right? I'd be scared, right? So that, if that's not good enough, right, a couple minutes later, Moses shows up on the mountain. That was 1,400 years before, and he shows up on the mountain. So there's, there, there's Moses, Elijah, and, 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 and Jesus, and his disciples... And they're hanging out, right? And as if that's not freaky enough, all of a sudden, God, this one that you guys all raised your hand, said you believe in, but you're not quite sure what to do with him. That God right there, speaking of his son, he looks at him and says, and they hear it from a cloud. That's going to freak you out, right? you got to put some depends on or something because you're like freaking out, right? All of a sudden, what do you hear from the cloud? And I'll just use my best Charlton Heston voice. This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him about Jesus. Right? That's crazy. And so what if, just what if, what if you actually did obey and follow Jesus? What would happen? I don't know. What would it look like in your life personally? I do not know what it would look like. I mean, you believe in God. You said you did when you raised your hand. And so what if this God that you believe in actually said this? Just what if? What if he actually said that? You've got to make a choice. What you're going to do with that. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Now, why should you listen and follow Jesus? Other than this voice out of a cloud says to listen and follow him, like, that's great. But why should you listen and follow Jesus Christ? So here's some more info I want you to see. Luke chapter 19. Go there. Luke chapter 19. Another cool story. Just giving you some facts. I want you to chew on these things. I just want you to what if. Just what if. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. You there? Okay, so listen to this. Just consider these things, right? Just consider these things, these truths in Scripture. So after telling a story, it doesn't even matter what the story is, okay? It doesn't matter. Jesus went on toward Jerusalem. See, he's, a, he, he, he's, he's, he's eventually going to get to that 
place where he's going to have the Passover dinner with his disciples, then he's going to go to the cross and die and all that kind of stuff. We all know all that, right? So after telling this story to his disciples, he went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As they came to the town of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. This is crazy right here, okay? Go into that village over there. So you're, now, now think about this, okay? I, I, just pretend for a moment that, that you're Jesus, right? You're not in Jerusalem, right? You're not in Jerusalem. You're in another town. So, so let's just say this, like, let's say Leesburg is Jerusalem, right? So, so where you would be is like Tiberias, okay? You're not here. This is what's going on here. And so Jesus stops in Tiberias and says, listen, I want you guys to go to Leesburg, Okay, just so you can kind of understand what's going on here. He tells them, okay, as you enter that village over there, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, hey, I'm sure they would, right? Why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Is that going to fly in Lake County? Just wondering. <laughs> so they went and found the colt just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds <laughs> spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When they reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. So, why should we follow Jesus? Other than this mysterious voice out of a cloud that says you should, why, why, why should we do it? Well, in this little story right here, we see four crazy truths. Four crazy truths. Um, I just want to say this. If you read the Bible... When Jesus is referring to that God that you all said you raised your hand to, that he believed like this in the sky thing, yeah, he talks about his father, right? He talks about his father. But in this case, it's a little bit different. He didn't say my father needed it, right? Who needed the donkey? No, 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 no. Who needed it? By name. By name. Jesus needed it, right? God the Father's not coming down out of heaven and riding on this thing, right? Jesus is going to ride on this thing. And he says, the Lord needed it. He didn't say anything. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. You ever hear that one? Oh, I've heard it lots of times. Um, he didn't say, tell him Jesus needs it. He didn't say, tell him the rabbi needs it. He didn't say, tell him Joseph's kid, the carpenter, needs it. What did he say? The Lord needs it, right? He, 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 he proclaims his deity right then and there. And that's not the only time. John 10, 30. He says, I and the Father are one. John 14, 9. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Colossians 2, 9. This is awesome. In Christ lives all the fullness of God. How much? All the fullness of God in a human body. Jesus announces his deity right here in this text. That's why we might want to follow him. Because he's God. Because he's God. Here, here's the second thing, right? So remember we're talking about Leesburg and Tiberi. So let me just ask you a question. You guys look pretty smart, and we're supposed to, listen, you know the Bible says that you're supposed to be able to do even greater things than Jesus, right? Okay, some people take that a little bit too arrogantly, and I'm going to show you why right here, right now, okay? You know, when you go into where I live, at the groves of Bay Tree there in Tavares, when you pull in, second house on the left, there's a little um, white Ford Ranger that parks there. Um, is it there right now? Duh, you don't know. Well, maybe somebody came and picked them up. Um, are they home? Yeah, you don't know. Right, exactly, because you're not God. That's why. But he does. He looks at another town that they're not in yet, and he knows that there, there's going to be a donkey sitting right there at that fence post. And it's going to be tied. And listen, not only do I know it's going to be there, but I also know that the owner's going to be standing right there too, and he's going to question what you say. And I also know that it's never been written before. How does he know all that stuff? Because he's God. He can see stuff that we can't. That's why. That's why you should follow him right then and there. Okay? That's why. So he, he, he says, I see the donkey. I see where it is. I, it's going to be there. It's never been ridden. And I want you to take it. And they're going to say, don't. And why? And you're going to tell them that I need it. And they're going to say, fine. Really? 
That's it? That's your, that's your plan, Jesus? Just tell him that the Lord needs it? And listen, this is why he's got to be God, right? He's got, right that, let me tell you something. I have a nice motorcycle, a 2004 Honda VTX 1300. Don't ever tell me that the Lord needs it and take it from me. <laughs> Never. It's not going to work, right? I see you eyeballing me right now. Don't be thinking about that thing, okay? Right? Yeah, you got one now. Right? So, listen. Hey, why are you taking my car? The Lord needs it. Okay? Is that ever going to happen? Never going to happen. But it did here. It did here. I'm going to show you why in just a second, right? Not only did the owners give the donkey away, just like, okay. Let me ask you guys a question. Anyone ever rode like an unbroken horse? How'd that work out for you? Yeah, not good. Right? Not good at all. I try to find some funny YouTube videos of people falling off unbroken animals, but there's way too much cussing in it for church, so I couldn't play it. <laughs> like, it's not going to work out good for you, right? But listen, Jesus rode an unbroken donkey, right? <laughs> so, so listen, the, you know why the donkey was like, like, there's no way you're pulling this off, right? But why did they just throw like a jacket over the donkey and Jesus just goes, okay. And it just says, and he rode along. Why, why is the, is the donkey giving in like that? And why are the people who own it giving in like that? I'll tell you why. Zechariah 9.9 said, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble riding on a donkey. That's why. Because there's going to be a Messiah that would come, and he, so when he says, there's a donkey over there, go get it, I'm going to ride it, it has to happen. But if you say that, it doesn't have to happen. But when he says that, it has to happen, and this is the reason why you should follow him. You understand? So what if, what if, just what if, Jesus Christ is the Lord God Almighty? And what if he is this king that's spoken of in Scripture? What if you did listen to him? And what if this God-man, Jesus Christ, is killed? And that even the grave has to submit to him, and he raises from the dead, right? What if that actually happened? That's an epic, epic occasion. And, and here's, the, here's the thing. The Bible says this. This is crazy. That when you believed in Jesus, he gave you his Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of things about the Holy Spirit that are mysterious and mystical and crazy and people are spooked out about it. But listen, third person of the Trinity, God of gods, totally awesome, rocking, we can talk about him more. But here's one thing about that Holy Spirit that you got when you said yes to Jesus. If you are a Christian, Romans 8.11 says this, that the Spirit of God that you got at, 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 at conversion, the Spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Amen. Just think about that. What if that is actually true? That what if the, that the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead, that caused this resurrection, that, you're, that drew you here today to celebrate it, what if that same Holy Spirit that raised Him from the dead actually does live inside of you? Just think about that for a second. What a resource, right? What a resource. What if Jesus is Lord over all? And what if the unseen God you acknowledge actually did say you should listen to him and follow him? And what if there is a power in you to do and experience things you've never experienced before? What if is all I ask? And if this spiritual power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead actually lives inside of you then what if you would just consider this galatians 5 16 says so i say let that spirit guide your life and verse 25 even more precise let that spirit guide every part of your life and i just want to tell you right now i just want to admit with you that that is a tough choice that's hard that is so super hard. But wasn't it hard for the ladies at the tomb? 
How many people in here think that if they follow Jesus by the letter, that they're going to get, in this country, going to get arrested or killed? Probably not. People might not like you. They might think you're a pig-headed, stubborn, mule, closed-minded Christian. I say amen. But they're not going to put you in jail and kill you. But those ladies very well could have. And as we see in history, most of those early disciples, that's exactly what happened. Put in jail, tortured, and killed. So it's not easy to let him guide every part of your life, but you can choose. And what if you actually did follow God in every part of your life? What would that look like? There's only one way to find out. And I'm not wise enough, nor is anyone on this planet wise enough to tell you the exact details of what it would look like if you choose to follow the Spirit's guide in all areas of your life. What if you moved from he's big and he's real and he is God to he's my Lord and I choose to listen to his voice and I choose to spend time in his word and I choose to spend time in prayer. I choose to obey and I choose to follow him. What would that look like? What if God's ultimate desire for his greatest creation, which is you, isn't to simply acknowledge his being? Maybe that's just not enough. That's not the apex of anything. But it's the, usually the conclusion of most. Hebrews 11, 6 says two things. Not only do you need to believe that he exists, but that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Don't you want to know what that would look like? Don't you want to know the rewards of the creator of the universe? Who would like a gift from me today? Just, just a gift, anything. Who knows, something. Money, a new car, a motorcycle, a new wardrobe. Who would enjoy that today? Just be honest. You'd raise your hand, right? Of course. But what about the creator of the universe? What if he wanted to reward you today? Why would you sell yourself short on that? I can't give you anything possibly within the same universe as awesome and glorious as what God could give you. And that's what he's calling you to. Listen, if, you never, if no one ever on earth ever said yes to Jesus, he's still God. He doesn't need us, but he wants to bless. And, and he doesn't want you to leave it on the table and waste his offer. Grab it. Grab it. <clears throat> See, that's the difference between the, the guards and the lady disciples. The guards believe that he exists, but they do nothing with it. Nothing in response. Well, the ladies believe that he exists. And they were scared as well, but they chose to obey and to follow him. So in conclusion... I just want to say that God wants us to experience the resurrection, not just simply acknowledge it. Don't just choose to once a year put on a half-pressed shirt and come to church. Like That's all good. That's a great start. I hope that if that's you today, that maybe you make the choice if you feel something that's stirring you to do something different, that maybe you're just tired of what is. You're tired of settling for what you have and just like, you know what? I'm just going to give this Jesus a try. Listen, I'm not trying to convince you of anything, but Jesus told his disciples, the early ones, and he says it now. He says, hey, come and follow me. He didn't pressure them. He didn't even give them any theology. He just said, come follow me. And they didn't know what was going to happen. But what did they do? Okay. And they just gave it a whirl. So maybe that's all I'm asking you today is maybe just consider it. God wants you to experience a life where he's the Lord. A life where he leads. A life where his power and his presence and his provision are evident. A, mar a life that's marked by the earnest pursuit of him that he absolutely guarantees he will reward. And again, don't you want to know what that is? Do you ever want to get to the end of your life and go, you know, I wonder what it would have been if I had actually done what Mama said? <laughs> if I had actually done what that crazy Jew up on that stage kept saying week after week after week, I wonder what it would be. I could tell you this. 
If you choose to follow Jesus in the every days, in the every moments, you'll discover senses you didn't have. You will experience life at such a deeper, higher level than you ever. No job, no relationship, no house, no car, no anything will ever, ever, ever be able to deliver like you'll have when you follow Jesus. What if Jesus Christ truly went from some person you know of to taking his proper place in your everyday life as Lord? What if you actually did follow him? What if he actually went from Christmas and Easter on the calendar? Can you bring that up? What if he went from that? What if that's you? What, what, if, what if Jesus went from that and some far off God that you know about and you've heard about and you've talked about and you've gathered around the table and you've heard grandma and grandpa talk about him and you acknowledge that he is but really, actually, this is who he is. He's just a far away God. He's way over here. But what if instead of being some far off God that you've heard about, you know about, but maybe you choose to take him off the calendar and bring him here close. Make him the Lord of your life. You bring him in from the perimeter and you bring him in close. And he actually becomes your God, not just some God of the universe, some ethereal being way out there but you let him come close and you move in tight and you move from that to this. And maybe you put him in front and let him lead you and you follow where he goes. See, here's what I think. I think that there's people in this room right here, right now that are considering what I've said. You're thinking, well, Maybe there is something to that. Maybe there is something better than what I have right now. What if I did make Jesus a bigger part of my everyday life than just acknowledging that he is? It might be better. And that might be you. I can tell you this, though. For those that are considering moving Jesus in tighter, I can promise you this one thing as you consider this. That also in this room are people who have made the choice to do this. And not a single one of us are considering anything else. Because once you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, nothing else will ever satisfy you. Amen. I want to pray with you now. What if, what if, what if Jesus Christ really is the Lord God Almighty? And what if this resurrection that brought you here today to church, either for the first time or in a long time, there was something special what if this resurrection is not just something Jesus did 2,000 years ago? But what if this resurrection is something that you could experience right here, right now? What if you decided to do as this unseen God that you believe in told you to do, and that is to follow, listen to his son and follow him? And to let the spirit that he gave you, when you said, yeah, I believe in Jesus, to actually let that spirit guide your life what if what if you did that what, what 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 would happen I don't know what that is but God you have a plan and a purpose for every single person your word tells us that it's your desire that all people are saved and to come to an understanding of the truth that's what you want You want us to love you with all of our mind, heart, soul, and strength. 
But if we look really at our life, it's not really the case. And so some of us may need to just repent and say, I'm sorry for that. It's not my best, God. You gave me your best. I gave you virtually nothing. But if you want to change that, if God is knocking on your door, if he's showing up here today, not just in a story, but he, you sense that he's calling you to something greater, and you're willing to take that risk as his disciples did, not knowing what's ahead of them, but trusting in the sovereign king of the universe. If you'd like to make that decision today, the warm, welcoming waters of baptism await you. And they would wrap their arms around you just like Jesus would. If you want to make that decision to no longer just believe that he exists, but that you actually want to follow him in the every moment of your life. And maybe there's people in this room right now that it's been years and you said yes to Jesus, but you've never actually followed him. You've never actually listened to the voice from the cloud that said, this is my dearly loved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And truth be known, we haven't been listening. But if you want to make a decision today to venture into the deep waters of the unknown, but trust the ultimate life jacket, who is Jesus Christ, in those waters, you can make that choice right now and begin to experience the resurrection, the power that raised Christ from the dead that lives in you. If you'd like to make that decision right now to begin to follow Jesus, nobody's looking, you can just raise your hand. He sees, he knows, he loves, he welcomes. If you want to start that relationship, even right now, you can say yes. Just put your hand up in the air. Let him see it. Just say, I want that. I want that. Scriptures say when the, when the gospel was shared, the people said, well, what do I do? Believe and be baptized. That's what you do. And part of following him in every moment of our life is being obedient. Okay, Jesus, this is what you said to do. I'm going to start that obedience right now. And so if you'd like to be baptized, we could do that right now. What a memorable Easter 2019 would be to look back on your calendar and say, that's the day I made the decision to move Jesus from way out there to right here as my Lord, whom I love. If that's you, you can come forward. We'll do that right here, right now. we got towels. As you consider these things, I'm going to tell you that here at Revolution, we're going to take a moment and we're going to receive our offering. If you're a guest here this morning, your presence is your offering and we so much appreciate it. And I know even if this is the one time a year you come or the only time you've ever come, That's an offering to God that I know he loves, that you would come and just listen to him. So we're going to take a few moments and we're going to pray. We don't just tithe here, strip off 10 bucks out of our pocket or whatever's in there. No, the Bible says we're supposed to pray about everything. So that's what we do at our church. So if you just give us a moment to do that, we're going to ask the Lord to lead us in the way that we should give. We're investing into people. We're investing into the kingdom because we want other people to experience the resurrect, resurrection power that many of us have experienced in our life. And that's what we're investing in so others can experience it the same. So Father, I just pray that you'd lead us in the way that we should give. Lead us in the way we should partner with you in advancing the good news of your son, his death, burial, and resurrection that gives life. 
How should we partner with you in that, Lord? Meaningful investment. That's what we want, Lord. So speak to us, please. We're listening. Men will come through the room in just a moment, and you can give according to the way you're led. There's boxes on the back walls. You can give according to the way you're led. They call him Jesus.